Um, but I'm the owner of Safety Matters, and I've been working with RCAW for a few years now. And Tracy and I decided to cover fall protection again for the new season. Um, Aaron covered fall protection around this October of last year. The, the Department of L and I um, moved the, the fall protection codes from the construction 296155 code. So there's no construction codes that are um, in the construction 155 codes. Now it's 296880. I stand the change or the biggest thing that hasn't changed is um, a lot of people thought that the 10 foot exemption was going to go away when they were talking about moving the code to the 800 codes. There was a rumor out there that they were no longer going to allow the exemption that low sloped roofers and leading edge workers could work up to 10 feet without any fall protection. That exemption still exists, but I wanna be really clear about this. It only applies for roofers performing roofing tasks on a low sloped roof, which is a 412 or less. And roofing tasks are defined as stocking roofing materials, removing roofing materials, or performing roofing tasks, like installing roofing materials. So what, what I mean by that, that is like if an electrician got up on a roof to, to do some sort of, you know, penetration for an electrical conduit or something like that, they would not meet the exemption. It has to be roofers performing roofing work or leading edge workers. And I will explain leading edge a, a little bit later, but this slide here breaks down each section of the new 880 codes. And so in my opinion, what they've kind of done is they've mimicked the construction codes and put them into the 800 codes. So anybody that works in general industry or fixed industry, they would be the ones who are mostly affected by these new rules. Construction pretty much remain the same. Okay, so one thing to also remember is there's no six foot rule in Washington state. A lot of contractors that work outside of Washington, when they come to Washington, they're like, what do you mean fall protections required at four feet? But that's where Washington state is stricter than federal OSHA. Federal OSHA has a six foot rule, <laughs> excuse me, a six foot rule and a 10 foot rule. But Washington state has a four foot rule and a 10 foot rule. Where the six foot rule I think gets mistaken is Washington state says that you cannot allow an employee to free fall more than six feet. So if you use like a lanyard that lanyard couldn't be more than six feet long. And the reason for that is you can see here that if a 200 pound worker falls six feet and they're, if they're arrested by their fall at six feet, the, uh, the force of impact is 2,400 pounds, which is why all lanyards, retractable lifelines, rope grabs, um, have to have a decelerating device or a shock absorber. And that shock absorber has to be rated for 1,800 pounds or less. 
Most of the newer shock absorbers are rated at 900 pounds, which now allows a anchor point to, to only have to withstand 3,000 pounds, not 5,000 pounds. If you have an older shock absorber or decelerating device that is rated for 1,800 pounds or less, your, shock, your anchor point has to be 5,000 pounds. If it's rated for 900 pounds or less, your anchor point now only has to be rated for 3,000 pounds. So that's, that's one of the newer changes as well. Um, here's the definition. The old definition of the leading edge was the advancing edge of a floor, roof, or formwork, which changes location as additional floor, roof, or formwork sections are placed, formed, or constructed. So this shows a picture of somebody working on like top plates laying plywood. The, the laying of the plywood, the rolling of the floor joists, um, that sort of thing is considered leading edge work. Um, the new definition is the advancing edge of a floor, roof, or formwork, which changes location as a additional <coughs> floor, roof, or formwork sections are placed, formed, or constructed. The leading edge is considered to be an unprotected side or edge during periods when it is not actively or continuously under construction. So they've clarified that definition a little bit, which I think is, is, is good. This has always been a very confusing thing for people. The, when, when the plywood is complete, now it is a perimeter edge and it would be considered a walking working surface that would need to be protected at four feet. So once this worker is done completely covering this surface with plywood, they would have to put up guardrails or continue to be 100% tied off at four feet or more because it's no longer actively under construction and is no longer considered a leading edge it is now a perimeter edge. So they've helped clarify that a little bit. Here's the old definition of the walking working surface. It was an area including, but not limited to floors, a roof surface, bridge, the ground, and any other surfaces whose dimensions are 45 inches or more in all directions, through which workers can pass or conduct work. A walking working surface does not include vehicles or rolling stock on which employees must be located in order to perform their job duties. So the new definition removes the 45 inch dimension. And now what they're saying is a walking working surface is any surface, whether horizontal or vertical, on which an employee walks works or gains access to a work area or workplace location. Walking working surfaces include, but are not limited to floors, ground, roofs, ramps, bridges, runways, stairs, dock boards, formwork, and reinforcing steel, but not including ladders. This is also something that's very confusing for people. Ladders have a vertical standard and they have their own set of rules just like scaffolds, just like confined space. Um, so ladders don't fall under the new unified fall protection standard and scaffolds don't either. So if you're working from a ladder, the rules are very different, just like if you're working from scaffold. Um, they have their own vertical standard where fall protection is a uh, horizontal standard. Okay, so here's, I'm not going to read through all of this, um, but these are the general requirements that basically say that an employer must ensure that all surfaces on which employees will be working or walking on are structurally sound. There's inspection requirements. Um, in your fall protection plan, you want to make sure that you include language that states that 
all fall protection equipment will be inspected visually. You don't have to do a daily documentation of inspections, but somewhere in your fall protection plan, you should have language that says, you know, all employees will visually inspect all fall protection equipment prior to each use. If found effective, it will be removed from service or if it's impact loaded. If an employee falls and their harness, their lanyard, their rope grab, their retractable lifeline, if it's impact loaded from the fall, it has to be removed from service. So there needs to be some kind of language in your fall protection plan that addresses inspections. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, the inspections don't have to be documented daily, but the equipment does need to be visually inspected daily. Um, the employer must only use personal fall arrest systems, fall restraint systems, positioning device systems, and, and all components for fall protection only. You can't use your fall protection equipment to rig materials, just like you can't use rigging materials as fall protection. Fall protection materials are um, rated for bursting strength and rigging materials are rated for tensile strength. So they're, they're rated differently and they can't be intermixed. And you have to have a rescue plan also addressed in your fall protection plan. So if you had employees working up on a roof with a rope grab and the, the, the let's say that the roofer had too much slack in their rope and they fell over the edge of the building, an employer has to document what the rescue plan is. Common rescue plan would be reach them with a scissor lift, set up a 40 foot extension ladder and you know they can rest on the ladder if they're waiting to be rescued by um, the EMTs or, or, or whatever your plan is. But you can't just say you're gonna call 911. You have to document what your rescue plan is. Th that isn't anything new. That has been in the code for years. Okay. Um, this kind of shows some inspection guidelines, you know, train your employees to look at all, all the webbing, look for cuts, tears, abrasion, fraying, look for cracks and breaks or corrosion in the D rings, the tongue buckles and, and the ropes, all components of your personal fall arrest system need to be inspected, including the anchor points. So your harness, your rope grabs, your whatever your connecting devices and your anchor points all need to be visually inspected prior to each use. So floor holes and floor openings, nothing's really changed from the old rule to the new rule. Um, bottom line is guys, any hole or floor opening a hole would be you know something small that you could drop like a, a screwdriver or, or a nail could fall through and and land on employees below have to be protected a floor opening is something that is 12 inches by 12 inches or larger <coughs> that a worker could actually fall through those have to be protected and secured and marked whole or cover, do not remove, and they have to meet 200 pounds strength. So you could that, the, this above picture here, this is a floor opening. I can't just throw a piece of plywood over that and leave it loose. It would have to be covered, secured, and marked whole, do not remove, and have to meet 200 pounds bursting strength. Here, I could just plug these with, you know, a piece of plywood and, and, you know, or a two by four or something, and it doesn't necessarily have to be secured or meet any type of bursting strength, but it would have to be covered. Um, any impalement hazards. 
have to be covered. So, you know, here's some examples of rebar protection. Um, this looks like the, they're, they're missing the protection, but he could fall into this rebar. So all impalement, whether it be possible vertical impalement or even brush by impalement. If this were an area where employees could walk and they were walking by these bent over rebar, they would have to be protected. The thing to remember is even if your roofers aren't working you know, near this area, it's the concrete subcontractor's responsibility to protect any impaled hazards. But the problem is, is if your roofers are walking by this area or this area to gain access to their working area, if they're exposed to these hazards that are unprotected, you guys could be subject to a citation because labor and industries can issue citations to the controlling contractor, which would be the GC, the creating contractor, which in this case would be the concrete subcontractor, and the exposed contractor. So again, if your workers or roofers are exposed to these impalement hazards, you could be issued a citation. So that's why it's important that um, <clears throat> all employees are trained on all potential hazards, which is why we do things like site-specific orientations and, and that sort of thing. Because even if they're not creating the hazard, they could have potential exposure. Okay. Um, this addresses the training requirements. When we provide fall protection training, there's certain curriculum that we have to cover. And so this identifies what we have to cover, the nature of fall hazards, when and what type of fall protection is required, the correct procedure for erecting, maintaining, assembling, disassembling, and inspecting fall protection systems, <laughs> the use and operation of fall protection systems, the limitations of the system, how to properly care, maintain the useful life or removal from service. Um, various requirements of this chapter have to be covered, you know, like the fall protection plans, um, talking about things like free fall is only allowed up to six feet. Um, what I just talked about with deceleration devices having to meet 900 pounds or eight, up to 1,800 pounds, that sort of thing. Um, make sure before an employee is allowed to perform work requiring the use of fall protection that the employee can demonstrate an understanding of the training and demonstrate the ability to use the fall protection properly. So when we do fall protection training, we do an exercise where we have the individuals don a harness and show them how to properly fit a harness, make sure the D-ring is in between their shoulder blades, make sure their leg straps are nice and snug and everything fits properly. L&I compliance officers are trained to prove competency. So if they ever come out to a site and they see like a worker wearing a really loosely fit harness or ha they have too much slack in their rope grab or their lifeline to their rope grab or, or something like that, they might question their competency. So that's why it's real important to make sure that employees understand how to properly fit a harness, understand, you know, taking slack out of their rope or how to install an anchor per the manufacturer's installation requirements and things like that, because they might have to prove competency. Okay. <clears throat> and obviously the training has to be conducted by a competent person. I am a firm believer that employers can train their own employees, whether it be the foreman or a lead or their safety manager, whoever an employer wants to deem competent 
you can absolutely do fall protection training internally. As much as I hate to say this, you don't have to be trained by, you know, a third party consultant like Safety Matters. I mean, I, I think it's important that your competent persons go through a thorough, you know, like eight hour competent fall protection training. And then you, those competent persons can do the, um, <clears throat> the on-site, site-specific training. Um, I would highly recommend that whoever you put in charge of filling out your fall protection plans, that they attend a competent person fall protection training, learn how to fill out fall protection plans, learn how to review fall protection plans with the crew, um, they can teach their crew how to properly don a harness, how to properly install an anchor point, how, you know, how to inspect their personal fall arrest systems, things like that. And I, I think that that's ideal, is that you empower your foreman or your lead, whatever you call them, um, to, to enforce your fall protection plans and to train the crews on your fall protection plans. That's an ideal situation in my opinion. I was a carpenter for 12 years before I got into safety. And to me, the best trainers for things like fall protection and site specific um, trainings are your foreman or your leads, the people that are running the crews. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let me so this is the definition of a competent person, and this would be for anything. It could be for excavation, trenching, for fall protection, for confined space. It's just basically somebody that has the knowledge of fall protection equipment, including the manufacturer's recommendations, instructions for proper use, inspection, and maintenance, who's capable of identifying an existing potential fall hazards, and has the authority to take prompt corrective action to eliminate these hazards and is knowledgeable of the requirements. Guys, I can't stress this enough. I literally five minutes before this lunch and learn, I was on the phone with a residential contractor, general contractor, who is looking at their third repeat serious fall hazard that is being cited by l &I this year. They are in some serious trouble. I, they, we don't know what the fines are going to be. They're, they're, they're having their closing conference with l and I at two o'clock today, but they are freaking out because it is their third repeat series in a year. Yesterday, I was on the phone with a framer who just got hit with a repeat series, second fall violation. He has under 10 employees and the fine was $29,000 because it was a repeat serious. They are not messing around with these, with these citations. When it comes to imminent danger or, or the focus four, which is falls, electrical, struck by, and caught in between. If you are found in violation of those four things, falls, electrical, caught in between, or struck by, the fines are pretty astronomical, and this is kind of new. I didn't used to see the kind of fines that I'm seeing these days. And so I hate to talk money because what really matters here is workers' safety, but the, the fines are crippling to some of these smaller organizations. And I, I can't stress this enough. And unfortunately, most of the violations that a roofing contractor is going to face <coughs> are typically falls. So when you guys get hit with these violations, they're more often than not repeat serious because they're the same type of violation, which is falls. Um, and the fines are unfortunately becoming astronomical. Okay, so what makes a person competent? Again, knowledge, skill, ability, training, education, experience, and authority. That is one thing that I 
can't stress enough is whoever you put in charge of writing your fall protection plans, enforcing fall protection out at your job sites, and following through with discipline, you have to trust that that competent person isn't afraid to send somebody home or write somebody up or follow whatever your disciplinary program is because that is the problem when we go to fight these violations is we typically can't prove that we have a program that's effective in practice. And the reason LNI says your program isn't effective in practice in most cases is because there's no discipline. There's no follow through. There's no um, consequences for bad behavior. And that's a tough thing to put on your foreman or whoever you put in charge of that. But you have to trust that these people have your back and will follow through with enforcement. Okay. Retraining. A good, when you have a problem child or you have employees that just aren't walking the talk and they're not playing by the rules, a good form of discipline is retraining, is to force your employees, even if they've had recent fall protection training, to force them to be retrained. That's a good um, option for discipline. Um, and so obviously all training also has to be documented. And so even if you do internal fall protection training, like you have your, your activity specific fall protection plan that your competent person completes, make sure that when they review that fall protection plan with the crews, that they are documenting um, the training. So have them sign off on the fall protection plan. Have them sign a fall protection roster that says that they've been trained by the competent person. The more you can document, the better off you'll be if, you, when, if you're dealing with labor and industries. Just, just covering it verbally isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to pass the test. Okay. So here is an example of leading edge work. If, if you had structural steel being erected and you, know, you have your iron workers erecting the structural steel, that's leading edge activity or that, that photo that you saw earlier with the framer laying the plywood on the top plate, that's leading edge activity. So that is allowed up to 10 feet without fall protection. A lot of the general contractors are not allowing this exemption and they have that right. And that's another confusing thing is you might work for one general contractor who says, okay, yeah, if you're on a low sloped roof and it's under 10 feet, you don't have to have fall protection. And then you go to another general contractor and they say, nope, we don't allow the 10 foot exemption they have every right to be more strict than labor and industries. So that can get confusing for your workers. Hey, when we were on this job, we were able to work up to 10 feet without fall protection, but now we're on this job and this general contractor isn't allowing the exemption. I would always double check with your general contractors and see what their rules are do they allow the 10 foot exemption? So once you're working at 10 feet or more, you do have to have a fall protection plan. Fall protection is required at four feet, but the activity specific fall protection plan isn't required until you have workers at 10 feet or more. Okay. So the fall protection plan has to identify the fall hazards, describe the method of fall arrest or fall restraint. Fall arrest would be a full body harness, rope grab with a lifeline attached to an anchor point. That's an example of fall arrest or a retractable lifeline or a lanyard attached to an anchor point. Fall restraint would be guardrails, catch platforms, safety nets, warning lines, things like that. 
Then you describe the proper procedure for the assembly, maintenance, inspection, and disassembly of the fall protection system. How are you going to install the anchor point? How are you going to maintain your anchor point? How are you going to inspect your personal fall arrest system? Again, that language would be prior to each use, all workers will inspect their personal fall arrest system, including their harness, their connector, their anchor point, if found defective or impact loaded, <coughs> it will be removed from service. That could be some language that would address how you're going to inspect, maintain and assemble. Keep in mind, you are only exempt from fall protection when you're installing or removing the anchor point. Once the anchor point is installed, you have to be 100% tied off before you even access the roof. This is probably the biggest challenge that roofers and framers and anybody that has to get tied off, um, this is probably your biggest challenge. The days of accessing a roof from a roof hatch or the ladder, walking from the ladder to the ridge of the roof is not a time that you don't have to be tied off. So you have to come up with some way to protect the worker before they even step up onto the roof. And I don't have the answers to this, guys. I can tell you what things I have heard and you're not going to probably like the answer, but I've had a compliance officer say, well, you have to put an anchor point right at that access point, right at that ladder. There has to be an anchor point. So they're standing on the ladder. They tie off to the anchor point. They get up onto the roof. Then they have access to another anchor point that's, you know, five, six feet away and they tie off to that. Then they have access to another anchor point that's five, six feet away and they tie off to that and work their way up the roof. Uh, that doesn't, I mean, it's feasible, but it's not practical. <clears throat> but if a, if a compliance officer sees somebody get off of a ladder and walk up to the ridge of, of the roof without any fall protection, they would be considered in violation. So you got to figure out how to be 100% tied off before you even step up onto that roof. Um, and that has to be addressed in your fall protection plan. How you're going to secure your tools and materials. Things like small tools will be carried in tool belts. You know, your hammer and, and screwdriver and tape measure and things like that will be carried in a tool belt. Large tools will be stored six feet away from the edge of the roof or in a gang box or might be you know, you might tie a, a five gallon bucket off with a rope and hoist it up after you get up onto the roof. Those kind of things have to be addressed in your fall protection plan. Um, how you're going to provide overhead protection. Hard hats are required 100% of the time. Maybe you'll barricade the area below with caution tape or danger tape. Uh, you might have a spotter if you're if you're removing roofing materials and you're tossing materials into a dumpster. You might barricade the dumpster with danger tape and have a spotter below. Um, you might have a garb a, a garbage chute where you're <coughs> you're putting the materials through the chute. That sort of thing that has to be addressed in your fall protection plan. Um, and then the method for prompt safe removal of injured workers. So again, maybe you have a 40 foot extension ladder that you can set up to rescue a fallen worker or a scissor lift or an aerial lift or you know whatever your means of rescue is. The fall protection plans have to be available if requested. They don't have to be posted. Back in the day, they used to say that they had to be posted. They've, they've, they've gotten away from that but they do have to be available upon request. I can't stress enough that whoever is completing your fall protection plans, your competent person, that they are reviewing it with your crews, having your crew sign off on it and training them on the activity specific fall protection plans. 
This is probably one of the most common documents that is asked for. Um, it's right up with safety meetings, weekly site inspections, site specific orientations, OSHA 300 logs, and fall protection plans. Those are the most common documents that a compliance officer will ask for when they're doing an inspection. Okay. So this just goes through exactly what I was just talking about. Tool belts will be used to carry hand tools. Large tools will be raised by rope and pulley or placed in an area that will not allow them to fall on others. This is just some, some language that you can use for your fall protection plans. Overhead protection, same thing. Hard hats, warning signs, warning lines, debris nets, tow boards. Those are all examples of language for your fall protection plans. We talk a lot about fall protection at 10 feet, but don't lose sight that fall protection is actually required at four feet or more. It doesn't make a lot of sense to tie off employees four feet. So we typically use guardrails. You can see in this picture here, if an employee is on stilts or they set up a ladder where they're gonna be working near their guardrails and they're up above the, the, the elevated surface that the guardrails are protecting, you have to add additional guardrails. You guys are all familiar with this. You see it in window openings, door openings and things like that on buildings where they have the guardrails at the required you know, 21 and 42 inches, and then they put them in at every 21 inches all the way up the opening. That's to allow work off of ladders and stilts or, or you know, um, <clears throat> other elevated work platforms that are being, you know, tasks that are being performed near the guardrail systems. So, if you want to look at the specifications of how a guardrail has to be built, it's now been moved to the 8804005. We're going to do part two of the lunch and learn in October. We'll also be on fall protection and I'll get into more of the specifications for guardrails and things like that in October's training. So stay tuned for part two. <laughs> it's too much to cover in an hour. So we, we we're gonna break it up into two different sessions. Okay, um, this is what I was talking about. If this window seal is less than 39 inches, you have to have guardrails. And so we'll get into that in uh, October. So, um, but if you want to look up those specifications, you can find them in the 800-40005 code. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk more about the specification for, hole, for floor holes and floor openings in October as well. And we'll get into specifications for warning lines and that sort of thing. But if you want to look them up in the meantime, that this is where you'll find the specifications for guardrails, covers for floor holes and floor openings and warning lines will, are in this, have been all moved to this new code as well. <clears throat> OK, 